Uh, I'd like to formally uh, welcome and thank Ed Zamora to come in and speak to us from Principia Prep. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to welcome all of our uh, parents and students and friends uh, from the area. I believe we're recording this tonight uh, so we can make it available to people. Um, if you have friends who couldn't join us, uh, we should be able to uh, get some information out to them as well as a recording. So uh, Ed, uh, we'll turn the microphone over to you. All right, guys. Um, I guess we'll start off with, my name is Ed Zamora. Uh, some of you may have already seen me. I do the local presentation here for the high school about the financial aid presentation process, so on and so forth. Uh, I've been in the world of calls now for about 20 years or so. So to this point, I've seen pretty much everything, or at least I thought I've seen everything until obviously this year happened. Um, today, we're gonna go over the landscape of the college environment the way I see it nowadays. To give you a quick insight, uh, I usually meet with anywhere between 2,000 to 2,500 families a year. Uh, this year, between February and now, I've received probably four to 500 phone calls, emails, text messages, et cetera. So I have a pretty good understanding of the landscape across the board. Today's presentation, we're gonna go over the financial aid aspects, how admissions is being affected, how that affects the financial components as well. We'll talk about the gap year, something I've been hearing a lot of lately with everything going on. We'll talk about some of the stuff happening with the SATs and ACTs. Uh, and hopefully the guidance office can also jump, uh, jump in on that as well and chime in about what they've been hearing and seeing. We'll talk about the college list, how to create it, how it affects the financial aid portions. Uh, we'll also discuss appealing financial assistance. So for seniors out there looking for help, um, as well as juniors and later on, how the appeal process actually works. We'll talk about the different financial aid forms, the FAFSA, the CSS, et cetera. And one of the unfortunate things I'm starting to see a lot of is more than ever before, scams and different frauds and different things are popping up. Parents being asked for bank account information from different colleges that don't even exist kind of stuff. So it's pretty crazy the stuff I'm seeing out there. But uh, if you guys have any questions about the presentation, uh, chime in, ask us any questions you guys would like. Uh, I'll also provide my uh, contact information at the end. If you have any questions, you can email me or as well as call us as well. Uh, we also have a newsletter that goes out every month telling juniors and seniors and everyone else what to do. If you want the newsletter, I'll also give you our contact information to get, basically get a hold of us for that. That being said, let's start off with essentially where we are nowadays. Uh, to be kind of upfront with the scenario we all find ourselves in, one of the things we all have to understand specifically on the financial aid end, as well as the admission side is, uh, a lot of us are not gonna have answers to the questions we have today. We're gonna have to be patient throughout this whole process. College is not a, a sprint, it's essentially a marathon. And the reason I say that is because in the hundreds of phone calls I've gotten over the last two or three months, I've gotten every single phone call you could assume to be received now by somebody looking for college assistance from bankruptcies, job losses, unemployment. Uh, I've had family members who've been lost to COVID. I've had parents who've been lost to COVID. I've had students who've been in induced comas because of COVID. So uh, I've seen the entire uh, ramification about what's happening, everything from the hospital side to clients of mine being nurses and doctors and everything else. So I I've, I've pretty much have heard every single question at this point in time you can hear. And one of the things that a lot of parents are asking about is obviously maybe the guidance office has heard as well about the online courses and being scared to send students off to college and these kind of things. The reality is every family has to sit down with their student, figure out what makes sense to them. Now, since college is years and years of education, if your student is to take off a semester or a year, the reality is it's not going to change their lives dramatically. What does change lives dramatically, unfortunately, is obviously what's happening in the economy as well as the people being lost to COVID. So I tell every family, every family situation is different. Sit down with your student and figure out what makes sense for you guys. Now, before the pandemic hit, typically when I'm talking to any family, I always look at there should be three different aspects to your college list, admissions process, financial aid aspect, the college process, I guess you can call it. Number one, the student should be able to go there and academically do well. It should be a school that has their major and is somewhere that they feel they'll do well academically speaking. That's the first fit I always look for. The second fit I always look for for any student, as far as the family, is the financial fit. Does this college make sense financially speaking? If it does, great. If it doesn't, let's move on. And then the third fit you're always looking for is a social fit. Does a student feel comfortable being there socially? Now, based on everything that's going on, if a student doesn't feel comfortable because the, the school is going online 
or you don't like the format of the schools as far as their opening. I mean, I've, I've heard everything from the colleges opening in August, allowing students to only be on campus, not allowing them to leave, to schools closing on Thanksgiving break, calling that the fall semester and you can't come back till February. So I've heard the whole gambit. So it's one of those things what you, what you really need to be doing throughout this process is, first off, it is a difficult time, but you have to start finding ways to enjoy the process. There are over 4,000 colleges out there, and it's very typical. It's 50% of the time, to be honest with you, a student will either transfer or change majors throughout their college career. So if you're looking to maybe stay closer to home because of safety or concerns, or if you're looking to switch colleges or ask for deferred semester or deferred year or gap year, these are questions you need to start asking directly to the admissions office. And this is not just for senior parents looking to go to college. This is also for the juniors. Because now with the colleges being shut down and everything else, obviously the college tours are becoming an issue because you can't actually see the college. We have a slide just for that, but I just wanted to throw that out, as well, out there as well. Also, for students who've been on the wait list, uh, especially the seniors, I'd be making those phone calls to the admissions office because I've been seeing wait list uh, of students coming off very quickly and some of them actually receiving scholarship money, which is extremely rare for a wait list student to be receiving scholarship money. But if you're on a wait list, I'd be calling up the admissions office, finding out where we are as far as wait list consideration is. And also, are we eligible for, or is there any possibility for scholarship consideration based on everything that's going on? This is the time you need to be asking as many questions as possible of admissions and financial aid. I know in some cases it's difficult to get a hold of people because of everything that's going on, but I'd be constantly calling, constantly emailing, asking about when you're opening, if you're opening, how are you opening, what safety concerns will you be handling for the students I'm sending out to you guys. All these questions should be things you should be asking the colleges. If you have unfortunately lost your job or there's been an issue with your company or something of that on the economic side, I would definitely be considering contacting the college's financial aid offices across the board and asking them for additional financial aid consideration. Based on the CARE Act, they actually, the colleges themselves received a lot of money. Between those monies and the monies they have in endowment, there's a lot of funding out there and I would definitely be going out there for senior parents and asking for as much help as possible. I'm gonna be talking about the appeal stuff as well in, in one of the slides we have here, but I just wanted to throw that out there right, just to kind of begin the process. Now that being said, Let's talk about this guy. One of the things that I always talk about during the presentation, especially for juniors and below, or in this case scenario, for seniors, for students that maybe didn't get into the college they wanted to, or were waitlisted or deferred, or if you have a student who's a junior or a sophomore, or maybe a freshman student, and they haven't quite figured out their, their way of doing things. Maybe they don't have a great GPA, maybe they're not uh, that enthusiastic about the high school education scenario, or whatever the situation may be. Or if you have a student going off to college next year and they haven't picked a major. The reality is, take your time. Everyone typically finds their niche and their way of doing things. The guy on the screen, he has the laptop I have was created by him, where essentially it was helpful, helped by this individual to be created. My iPhone was created by this individual. This guy didn't do very well in high school, but he did very well for himself in life. And so for parents out there who are wondering what direction should we go in, we're a little bit lost, don't worry. Things fall into place. And the best way to do that is always ask questions. Ask questions about the guidance office. Ask questions from the admissions office. Ask questions about financial aid. The more questions you ask, the better off you'll be. This guy in life actually ended up doing pretty well for himself. And I see this happening every year. And I've been doing this 20 years. I've had students go off to county college and transfer into Cornell, Columbia, Cooper Union, Harvey Mudd, all of them. I've had students go to uh, Syracuse Newhouse from Community College, which is an extremely good program for PR and marketing, et cetera. So if you haven't figured it out just yet, don't worry. And those who are wondering, the students are listening to you, believe it or not. You might not think they're listening to you as parents, but they are. And they're looking for you for guidance. Now that being said, and the fact that you're able to, from my point of view at this point, not worry so much about things that are not happening or things out of your control, one of the reasons is because of this. What many families don't realize is it's not so much the college your student goes off to that determines their career, life, success, etc. In most cases, it's a student themselves to determine their successes in life. To give you an example, we have on the, the screen here a list of colleges with the most Fortune 500 CEOs. 
Okay. As you look at the top, obviously you see Stanford and Harvard and all the rest of the name brand schools, the ones that you would expect to be at the top of the list. But the interesting thing about this is if you look a little bit lower down the list, you'll see Indiana and Rutgers University, a state school here in New Jersey, one of our public schools, has actually more Fortune 500 CEOs in history than does MIT. This is very important to realize when you're looking at your students list and wondering, are these schools good enough? Or is a school my students considering good enough in your eyes? Let's put it that way. The reality is the students dictate most of their success. Yes, the colleges do help through internships and co-ops and networking and so on and so forth. But the reality is it's the student themselves that dictates how successful they'll be in life. So if your student is not going to the top tier school, this is not an automatic end of scenario, not gonna get a good career situation. You have to realize the students can, with a good education, doesn't have to be top tier education, with a very good education can be very successful in life. Now, that being said, how do we even start for the juniors and below, sophomores, et cetera? How do we even start in the process of either building the college list or doing the research and figuring out how can we even get this stuff started? Okay, to the ball rolling, essentially. The first place every junior parent and below should be going is collegeboard.org, the website you see in front of you now. The benefit of College Board is it's a free website. On College Board, if your student comes home, let's say they, they say to you, I'm interested in Williams or Bard or Cooper Union or Harvey Mudd or Pomona uh, or McGill, and you have no idea what they're talking about. The benefit of College Board is on the top right, there's a little search bar you can see on your screen. You type in the school's uh, name. Once you type in the school's name, you hit the search bar and a profile will pop up of that college. The benefit of the profile is it allows you to gain a wealth of knowledge about that institution. The, the College Board site will provide you with location of the college, how big is the college, what major the colleges offer. It will also give you insight into how much the college costs, as well as on the profile of the college, it'll show you. Does the school give out scholarship money based on academics? Does it give out money based on financial need? This allows you to start building your knowledge of the college. It can also show you how difficult is the school to get into? How easy is the school to get into? Is it a school that requires uh, testing? Is it not requiring testing? What are the typical GPA requirements? What are the typical SAT requirements? This allows you to start building the list. Also on the profile, it'll show you schools that are similar to this college. So that way it allows you to start looking at other colleges and start doing the research. The biggest benefit for me on the College Board site is it shows you how much the college costs, all the different components, which we'll talk about in a moment, as well as how generous it is on the financial aid side, scholarship-wise, need-based-wise, and it also tells you and shows you in statistics how much money this college typically gives out to college students, or sorry, to students entering the university. Now, one of the biggest issues we're having now, obviously with the COVID and everything happening, is a lot of families are finding it impossible to be able to take the SATs or ACTs. And the biggest difficulty with not being able to take the test, at least at this point in time, obviously is that you can't get a benchmark, a starting point to figure out what scores are necessary. Now, the interesting thing with everything going on in the world is nowadays, based on all the different components of not being able to take the test, what has happened is more than ever before, colleges are going SAT, ACT optional. What you can see on the bottom of the slide here, the actual website, fairtest.org, this has a list. And here is what the website looks like. Let's pull it up. Fairtest.org has actually now over 1,200 colleges that are SAT, ACT optional, which means if your student's not scoring well on the test or maybe we're not able to take the test, it's now more than important than ever before to get on this website. It's a free website. There's no cost for fair test. The benefit of fair test is once you log onto the website, you see a blue box on the top right, that I guess in the middle there where it says 1200 plus accredited. On that link there where it says, see the searchable. If you click on that link, it will show you over 1200 schools in alphabetical order who are now SAT, ACT optional. The benefit of that is, is that the names of the schools have now been added are basically top tier colleges. We're talking about Amherst, Cornell, we're talking about Haddaford, Northeastern, Providence, Richmond, Villanova, Wake Forest, Williams is now an SAT optional college. Fairfield's on there, Quinnipiac, Ryder, Montclair. You'd be surprised how many name brand colleges are now SAT, ACT optional because of everything that's going on. Now, based on this, this is something that a lot of parents should be going on to and figuring out, 
is my college SAT optional or not? And if it is, maybe this might be the route to take, specifically since once the doors open for being able to take the SATs and ACTs, it's gonna be a stampede, to be honest with you. This is the same thing that happened in August when the SATs first uh, made the SAT available in August, the entire state of New Jersey filled up in like two weeks. The same thing exactly, the same exact thing's gonna happen this time, good, bad, or indifferent, because everyone needs to take the test or believes they have to take the test. So I would definitely be going on here and figuring out, is my school SAT optional or not? And if it is SAT optional, the first phone call you have to make is to the admissions office and ask them. This is a very important financial aid question. Your school is going to go SAT optional next year. This is for juniors and below. If we do do SAT optional or ACT optional, is this gonna be used against us for scholarship consideration? You wanna make sure to get that out of the way because some schools will use it against the students if you don't take the test scores to be considered for scholarship consideration, which is something you don't wanna happen. Find out later on that based on GPA and the rigor of the class schedule, you would have gotten a scholarship if you gotten a certain SAT or ACT score, but you didn't take the test. Okay, what you're gonna notice is a lot of the admission stuff and then in financial aid stuff kind of collide. They all kind of mix together. So there's a lot of questions you need to be asking throughout this process. Now, now that we kind of covered uh, some of the issues going on in the world with financial aid, admissions and college, et cetera, let's, not talk, let's start talking about for the seniors specifically, the, um, let me see here, for the seniors specifically, the gap years or taking a semester off. Now, typically a gap year is used for the student uh, growing or maturing, taking a year off to either travel or work or, or even to, in some cases, learn a trade. Um, now, I've been asked about the gap year a lot more than ever before. Uh, gap years have actually been around for about 60 or 70 years. So this is nothing uh, new, but it's something that's gaining a lot more popularity over the years. And now with the pandemic and everything going on, uh, with families a little bit more worried about their students going out to college, I understand why it's become more prevalent. Now, what you wanna do is if you're taking a gap year, specifically as senior students going to college, the first thing you wanna do is contact the college your, your student's considering going to, or the ones you've already made a deposit at, and asking them, what is your policy for us taking a semester off or a year off? Some colleges will tell you, no problem, we'll let you take off the, the fall semester, come back in the spring, your financial aid, everything else stays the same. Other colleges will say, we're not accepting that, uh, unless there's a doctor's note or a medical issue, which you might want to come up with in, uh, if you need to, if your situation kind of uh, veers towards that direction. Other schools are saying, we'll allow you to take a gap year and kind of wink, wink, please apply again next year and you're going to be accepted kind of thing. So it's best to, to talk to an admissions officer specifically for senior students. Now for the juniors, this is going to be a little bit different. For juniors, obviously as things change and the year progresses, and things kind of getting back to more normalcy, I guess you can call it. This may be something you want to utilize. It may not be something you want to utilize. Uh, the gap year is obviously for a lot of student athletes, uh, specifically hockey and baseball players. This is actually something that you use, uh, utilize a lot of. So a lot of hockey players take a year to kind of play and then uh, kind of mature and then go off to the D1, D2 programs. Uh, some of the uh, baseball players as well, they're pretty good to go to the minors. So for the athletic side of this, this has been going around for years and years and years. But for other students who are considering doing a gap year, it's not a terrible idea. This is something that specifically for parents, if you know your student maybe not be mature or ready for the college experience, taking a year off isn't such a bad thing. And a lot of colleges actually allow the student to defer a year of acceptance. So basically you get accepted through senior year, you can hold that spot, take a year, kind of go into doing a trade or taking courses or classes in different uh, disciplines you may not have done in college uh, or doing a job. Uh, or volunteer work, obviously that's a big one as well for the gap year, to allow your student to kind of grow and then kind of come back into the college process. Now, there's two websites here on the slideshow you see here. These are two uh, great articles and I guess different uh, resources that we've utilized and uh, told parents about in the, before in the past who've considered a gap year to kind of help build their, their research or knowledge about how the process works. Now, that being said, let's talk about building the college list and how you kind of go about this. Now, a lot of people uh, bring up the uh, fact that the college list in most cases doesn't have to do anything with financial aid, but I kind of differ from that understanding or that way of looking because the uh, financial aid admissions are basically one in the same nowadays, good, bad, or indifferent. Now, when you're building a college list, you're gonna have the safety schools, which are the schools your students very likely gonna get into. 
the target schools, which is kind of like a 50-50. It's a very good chance you're going to get accepted to that university or college. And then you have the reach schools, which are kind of like the dream schools, the higher level schools that are more difficult to get into. Now, the average college list is typically six to 10 colleges. That's how many students usually average uh, apply to. Now, if your student's looking at more competitive colleges, such as a program for physical therapy or engineering or nursing or these kind of things, then your list is going to be a little bit bigger. But typically, it's around six to 10 colleges. Usually, it's more than 10 if your student's looking at more competitive colleges. Now, when it comes to building the list, one of the things that most families don't consider, and this is specifically on the safety part of the list, is that on your safety part of the list, which is typically one to three different colleges that most students have for the safety picks, you know, the schools are definitely going to get into, is that you should be using schools where you know the school is going to give your student a bunch of financial assistance through scholarships. The reason you want to use your safety list to get scholarship money out of the colleges is because you want to use those schools to then leverage the target and reach colleges to up their scholarship amounts. So think of the safety school, at least one of them, if not two, if not more, of those schools should be giving us lots of scholarship assistance. Here in the state of New Jersey, two, two great schools for that are Ryder University and Fairleigh Dickinson. Both schools provide scholarships north of $30,000, in some cases $35,000 in scholarship funding if you have a strong student, academically speaking, good test scores, good GPA, et cetera. These are great numbers to use against the target and reach schools to try to leverage them into giving you more money. This is something that I would be doing as a senior parent now, and this is something I would be considering doing as a junior parent going in as I'm building my college list. Now, when you're building the college list, one of the other aspects to kind of consider throughout this process, and one of the places to go look for the scholarship money, is College Board, the website I mentioned before, the free site. You look at the schools that we talked about before, especially on, this, on your safety list, they'll show you which schools give out scholarship money. Second place you should go for more information about the schools and scholarship money, call the school's admissions office. The admissions office is the department that handles all scholarship funding. And the reason you're calling admissions is to start asking the questions such as, how much does a school typically give out in scholarships? I have a student who has, let's say, a B average with an 1100 SAT score. They'll typically say over the phone, well, this student is typically eligible for this scholarship. The next question you should ask the admissions office, the moment they tell you how much scholarship money they can give you, whether you're on a Zoom meeting with them or a phone call uh, or through email, next question should always be, what if my student gets a higher GPA? What if they get a higher SAT score? Can we get more money? Your goal through the admissions office, obviously, is to get the student in. But the admissions office is the first leg of this entire process to start reducing the cost of the college. Scholarship money will typically be the largest amount of reduction in college cost. And it's also beneficial because scholarships are guaranteed for four years. So you want to lock in those funds. And the way to do that is leverage the college out of the most money the first year you're going in because it's very rare that it'll increase the scholarship money going forward. So it's always beneficial increase it in the beginning. Now that being said, that brings us into a kind of a gray area as far as the admissions process goes. And what I mean by gray area is there's various different ways your students are getting accepted to college now. Various different ways they're applying, essentially. You have early action one, early action two. Uh, you have early decision one, early decision two. Now for those who aren't aware of how the early process works, early action one and early action two, everything basically starts uh, essentially in August when the Common App becomes available and some of the other applications. But the deadlines for the early processes, early action one, early action two, early decision one, early decision two, most of these deadlines uh, start popping up around November 1st. Now the way it works is early action, your student gets accepted to this college early on, typically around December or so, mid-December, but they don't have to go. That's what the early action process is. Early decision your student gets accepted early and they have to go. It's a binding contract. They are basically saying, yes, if you accept me to the college, I will be going. Which obviously from a financial aid point of view scares a lot of families because we don't know financially what we'll be getting just yet. Now I'll be talking about how to kind of circumvent this kind of a loophole in the system to kind of figure out how much the college will be giving you financial aid wise. But so don't worry about the early decision stuff just yet, because I'll be touching on that slide in a moment about how to consider early decision based on financial aid components, but it is a consideration. But when it comes to early decision, in my 20 years of doing this, and I've seen almost every college's early decision situation, 
most colleges that do early action or early decision are not going to say, especially for early decision, we have you, we're going to give you less money. Most of the time when the school says we've been accepted to early decision, they go out of their way to try to give you as much financial assistance as possible because they realize in many cases, the only way of getting out of early decision is the family can't afford it. Now, that being said, let's talk about the other aspects of the admissions process, which is typically the rolling and the regular. Now, when it comes to regular and rolling, most of these deadlines are not until February or March, or in some cases, April. There's actually, this year, believe it or not, still colleges accepting college applications at this point in time. Uh, with everything going on, obviously, uh, that would be expected to happen. Now, this is where a lot of families end up finding themselves in a weird situation and end up losing scholarship money. Now, if your student says to you, mom, dad, don't worry, the college application is not due until February or March, they're probably correct as far as the application for admissions, but they're probably wrong about scholarship consideration. Many of the schools who have later deadlines in February, March, and April for their applications for admissions have priority deadlines of December 1st for scholarship consideration, which means if you apply in February, March, and April, you're not being considered for scholarship money, which means you just shot yourself in the foot for probably the biggest portion of reduction in cost for most students. So if the student says, yes, the school is due later on, they're probably right as far as the admissions application. What you should do as parents is contact that school's admissions office and ask them, I understand your regular deadline, your rolling deadline is further down the line, but do you have earlier deadlines for scholarship consideration? This is very important because if you miss that deadline, you might not be able to negotiate or argue, whatever you want to call it with them, to get that scholarship back, especially if you start looking at the news nowadays. A lot of colleges are uh, very low as far as their endowments, as far as money available. So now is not the time to start missing deadlines, especially for junior parents. When it comes to the college visit, one of the things that a lot of families don't realize is this is one of the probably best places and times to start receiving information about getting discounts on the college. And what do I mean by that? Well, when the college tours start back up and everything else, and by the way, uh, kind of a little insider secret, I always tell families one of the best times to go check out the college is the end of August, early September, when the college is back in session. Because at that point in time, there's really not that many people visiting. High school hasn't started back up yet, so it's one of those times you want, might want to go check out the college if it's with everything going on in the pandemic, uh, feasible and safe and so on and so forth for you. Now, that being said, when you're on the college visit, you always want to bring three things with you. Number one, bring a copy of the student's resume showing extracurricular activities, work experience, achievements, honors, volunteer work, all of it. It doesn't have to be a perfect resume. It could be even just be bullet and board points outlined, but have that with you. Number two, have the student's high school transcript with them, showing the courses they've taken as well as their GPA. And third, bring their test scores, SATs, ACTs. If they haven't been able to take the test, uh, you can go in there and just say to them, uh, based on our tutor, we're expecting to get a 30 ACT or a 1200 ACT score, uh, SAT score, sorry. Um, or you can even bring the PSAT scores. The reason you bring these three things with you is because if you can sit down with an admissions officer, you can show them all three documents and essentially say, are we gonna get scholarship money, yes or no? An admissions officer will always be 100 times more candid with you if you're face to face with them than they would be over the phone or email because they can be more candid with you. And when you're sitting there, if they say, yes, you're eligible for scholarship money, as I mentioned before, you should always ask, what can we do to get more? If the SAT score goes up, if the ACT score score goes up, if we take AP courses, if we get a higher GPA, what else is there here for us to get for scholarship money? Because this is the first place to go to get discounts, okay? If you're not able to do a tour, obviously for juniors out there, we're trying to build a list. We have two resources on, on the slide here. You can see Campus Tours and you visit. Uh, I've gone through both websites. They're both very good. So they give you some insight about the college. Also, if you just Google the name of the college and virtual tour, a lot of schools have now put up virtual tours of their own on their website. So it's something where you can start kind of building the list if you're a junior student at this point in time, or if you, even if you're a sophomore student as well, kind of start building it up and kind of putting it together. Now, that being said, 
when it comes to, we've already talked about the kind of the admissions portion of this, about what's going on, so on and so forth. Let's delve into the cost of the colleges, uh, as well as the financial aid side and what's kind of going on with COVID and everything else. Now, good, bad, or indifferent, uh, with the changes going across the board, uh, I have not seen any colleges reduce cost. Uh, I do not expect them to reduce cost. Um, in 20 years of doing this, uh, I've never seen them reduce cost. Not because of the housing crisis, not because of the credit crunch, never have I seen them reduce the cost. So the opportunities for that to happen, unfortunately, are it's not gonna happen more than likely. In 20 years, I've seen about seven colleges reduce their cost. I've seen more colleges actually go bankrupt than reduce their cost, believe it or not. That being said, let's talk prices. A lot of you guys are going out there and doing the research and seeing that, you know, everyone's talking about in the different uh, news articles and research, you're seeing that most schools cost between, uh, for public schools at least, 12 to around $25,000 a year, public schools I'm talking about. This, unfortunately, is not realistic when you're talking about the tri-state area. In the tri-state area, our average cost for a public school ranges between uh, 15000 on the low end to around 35000 on the high end. On the private school side, we're also more expensive nationwide. Private school side, we're starting around 40000 and going up to 65000 for private colleges here in the tri-state area. And the, for the elite colleges, the more expensive schools, uh, you're looking at schools that now have actually gone over $80,000. As you can see here from the chart, uh, Columbia is one of those schools that actually has gone over the $80,000 mark. Uh, Fordham, NYU, these schools are all over 75,000. Even Fairleigh Dickinson uh, University, which I'm a graduate of, I also work there as one of the financial aid directors, uh, has now over, has exceeded $60,000. Now, the biggest error I see, and the reason that we put these numbers on there is to say to the juniors and below, yes, colleges are, are very expensive, good, bad, or indifferent. But the reality is you should never look at the college's cost in determining whether or not to apply to a college. The worst thing you can do is look at the college cost and say, I can't afford it, uh, I'm not gonna uh, apply to this college. You need to do the research. And I wanna kinda go through the steps of doing the research to figure out how generous a college is. So even if you're sh shocked, essentially, with a sticker price, never take a school off your list of, uh, on the admissions side until you do the research. Uh, also on uh, our YouTube channel, which we established about two weeks ago, we have a presentation that goes even further in depth on the financial side. Uh, I'll give you the YouTube channel at the end of the presentation as well, so you guys can go visit all other videos about, uh, more about the financial aid stuff, appeals. We also have a, a video about scams and stuff that are happening nowadays. So that being said, let's start talking about specifically the financial aid end. Now when it comes to financial aid, the first thing I have to do for everyone in the audience is explain to you guys what financial aid is, because good, bad, or indifferent, there's a lot of um, misunderstanding when it comes to the term financial aid. Financial aid actually means four things. It means scholarships, grants. Financial aid also means loans and work programs. The reason I say that is because if you go to any college and talk to any admissions officer, financial aid officer, anyone at the college, and you ask them, can we get financial aid? I guarantee you they're all gonna say, yes, you're gonna get financial aid. Reason being is at the moment you fill out the FAFSA form, which is the starting form of all financial aid, which we're gonna to touch on in a moment, your student, the moment that form is submitted, your student is eligible for a $5,500 federal loan. Every student. You could be bankrupt, foreclosure, or you could be Bill Gates, be worth billions of dollars, and you will all be offered a $5,500 federal loan. That way every college knows, yes, if you ask, can we get financial aid here, they're all gonna say, of course you will, because they all realize, fill out the FAFSA, you get a loan. Now, the way financial aid breaks down between these four components is this, and this is the terminology or I guess the verbiage you need to start using. After they say, yes, we provide financial aid, the next question you should ask is, how much gift aid, gift aid do you typically provide? Gift aid is the actual financial aid term for free money. That only covers scholarships and grants, the money you're not paying back. Now I'm gonna go into the loans and the work study stuff a little further down uh, the line here. I have slides for that as well. But the benefit of you guys going in there and asking about financial aid is, they're all gonna say yes. Make sure to go further in depth. Yes, you give financial aid, but how much of that is gift aid? I wanna know about scholarships and grants. These are the questions and the verbiage you need to be using throughout this process to make sure you're not getting the wrong information essentially. Excuse me. Now that being said, how do we qualify for financial assistance? Well, very simple. 
there's essentially three components in figuring out on the financial need side how much financial aid you should be getting as far as grant money. Now, when it comes to the colleges, the formula you see in front of you is how every college determines if you're eligible for financial aid. Doesn't mean you're gonna be getting grant money or free money, it just means you're eligible. The first part of this equation is called cost of attendance. Now, when it comes to cost of attendance, that is essentially what the college costs, everything included. And, I'm gonna sh and, and what goes into that is basically the tuition cost, the room and board cost, that's also miscellaneous cost, student fees, technology fees, parking fees, et cetera. When you're asking, this is something that most families don't do, but you need to do. When you're asking any department in the college how much they cost, you wanna make sure to ask them this way. You wanna ask them, what is your cost of attendance? By asking the college to provide the cost of attendance, they must provide you with all the aspects of the cost the average book cost, transportation cost, miscellaneous fees, technology cost, all the fees should be added in there. If you don't, many colleges will only provide you with the cost of tuition and room and board, which is a big component of what the college costs in total, but it's not the total cost. The total cost of the college is the cost of attendance. By law, the college must provide you with the cost of attendance. If you wanna find out a college's cost of attendance, fastest way is to call them or, once again, go on to collegeboard.com. On College Board, they will provide you with the college's breakdown of tuition, room and board, book cost, everything. College Board is a great resource. It's a free resource to use. So now that we have the total cost of the college, the next component is called the expected family contribution. The expected family contribution is provided to the family based on the financial aid forms. After you finish the financial aid forms, you will be given an expected family contribution, essentially what they think you can pay for college for one student going into college. So you subtract the expected family contribution from what the college costs, and what's left over is the, is the financial need, or essentially what the college should help pay for through scholarships, grants, loans, and work programs. As you go through this whole process, you're gonna notice that some colleges are very generous as you do your research, and some colleges are not very generous. Do not, this is where a lot of families kind of mess this up, do not look at your expected family contribution as this is all I'm paying. Look at it as this is the minimum I'm paying. It's kind of the guide, rule, kind of, kind of way of looking at it. There will be a lot of colleges that meet almost all your need. There will be some colleges that meet none of your need, unfortunately. Now that being said, how do they come up with the expected family contribution? Very simple. There's these two forms here. These are the two basic forms. On the left, you have what's known as the FAFSA form, used by every single college, from county all the way to Harvard. They all start by using the FAFSA form to start calculating your expected family contribution and providing financial assistance. The form on the right is called the CSS profile form. The CSS profile form is used for institutional aid. This college's own money. Every school uses the FAFSA. Only a handful, about 300 colleges use the CSS. Remember, there's over 4,000 colleges. So only about 300 use the CSS in addition to the FAFSA form. Now that being said, let's talk about first the FAFSA form. The website you see in front of you is where you fill out the FAFSA form as a senior parent after October 1st. October 1st for rising seniors, so for juniors right now, the students are rising from junior year to senior year, October 1st is the first date you can start filling out the FAFSA form. It's also the first date you can fill out the CSS and all the rest of them, but uh, of the prominent forms. But the FAFSA form available October 1st. Now, the FAFSA form itself does not consider your home as an asset. That's one of the first financial errors a lot of families make. So you do not put the FAFSA form on there. You do not put anywhere on the FAFSA form the value of your home. The second error on the financial side for the FAFSA form is placing your retirement assets on the FAFSA form, your 401k, your IRAs, your Roths, the retirement aspects, as far as the amount you have in retirement, the 403p, uh, 403b plans, none of the values go on the FAFSA. So no home value and no retirement assets. You don't put either one on the FAFSA. Now, when you're filling out the FAFSA form, you will have to create a username and password for the student and a username and password for the parent. The FAFSA will allow you 
to click on uh, the uh, returning user or new student user here you see on the screen, start here, and start the FAFSA with the student's first name, last name, birthday, and social. However, you cannot submit the form without getting the FAFSA logins. Now, the FAFSA logins are obtained on fsaid.ed.gov. You can either go directly to that website or if you could click on either the start button you see in front of you to start here or uh, actually if you click on the login button where it says under the returning user it's easier but if you click on the login button the next website you'll see it's going to ask you to log in using your FSA username or password above that it's going to indicate create an account you will have to create an account for the student and then create an account for the parent the student account is how you start the FAFSA form. So you start the FAFSA essentially as a student. Halfway through the FAFSA form as a parent, you will be allowed to log in to be able to upload your tax information directly from the IRS through a process called the IRS Tax Retrieval. Now, that's the easiest way to upload your taxes on this form, and it essentially makes your form in the eyes of financial aid roughly 99% correct. So it's the best way to do that. Now, when you're filling out the FAFSA form, everyone wants to know well, what else counts, what doesn't count, et cetera. They do want to know about cash, savings, investments outside of retirement. They don't care about your primary home on the FAFSA, but they do care about rental property or second uh, properties that you do have. So those things do get added to the form. Now, when it comes to the FAFSA form, everyone always wants to know how do they come up with or how do they calculate my assets, my income, and everything else. Here we have a chart. There's actually about, I believe, like a dozen different expected family uh, calculators. There's a bunch of them, depending on different variables, depending on income, depending on uh, household size, depending on a bunch of different variables. You also have two different financial expected family contributions based on the FAFSA and the CSS. The FAFSA has what's known as a federal methodology. The CSS profile has what's known as an institution methodology. And intertwining all those are different expected family contribution uh, calculations. Now, instead of confusing everyone of how it works, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through how a basic expected family calculator works as far as how does it count mom and dad's income and the student's income and mom and dad's assets and the student's assets. I'm going to start from the bottom and work my way up. I'm also going to give you a website at the end of this where you can calculate your own expected family calculation uh, number. So this is all just kind of give you an idea of how the basic formula works. You can go out and then start playing in one of the calculators I give you in a moment or later on after the presentation, et cetera. But I'm going to go through the numbers so everyone kind of has an idea of how this actually works and how it kind of comes uh, into fruition. Now, when it comes to the expected family contribution, as far as student assets, students have no deductions. So any money in the student's name as far as checking accounts, savings accounts, et cetera, any money you put on the FAFSA form, they want 20% of it to go towards the cost of college. So that's part one of four parts they add together. So let's just use an example. You put on the FAFSA form, your student has $1,000 in your checking account. That means $200 of that will be used as paying for college or the assumption of the expected family contribution will be at least $200. Part two, student's income. Students have a higher threshold now than ever before. Students are allowed to make up to $6,500 before $1 counts against them towards the cost of college. Now, when we're dealing with the junior students, for junior parents, you'll be using the 2019 tax returns to fill out your forms in October. Senior parents just use the 2018 taxes. For sophomore parents, that means 2020 tax year is what you'll be using when you fill out the financial aid forms when your students are seniors in high school. So for junior parents, based on the 2019 taxes, if your student made over $6,500, any money above that amount will be counted against them or basically used towards the expected family contribution at 50 cents on the dollar. Now, if your student made 6,000 or 5,000 or 4,000, it doesn't count. So it doesn't add anything to your expected family contribution. Once you go over the 6,500, let's say they made 7,000, They'll subtract 6,500, the 500 remaining, half of that, 250, will be added as part two. Part three, this is where it gets a little convoluted and a little bit difficult uh, as far as the equation, so I'm going to try to make it as easy as possible. For parents' assets, you have what's known as an asset protection allowance. When it comes to the asset protection allowance, 
parents have a certain amount of assets outside of retirement, uh, outside of the primary home, obviously, that don't count. And that number is roughly around $20,000. So let me give you an example. For parents, let's say all the money you have in the world in checking, savings, maybe in investments, is $18,000. And you put that on the FAFSA form under the cash and savings portion of it or under the investment portion of the FAFSA. They don't count it at all. And the reason they don't count it at all is because you're under the $20,000 asset protection. Once you go over that amount, they start counting parents' assets at 5.6%. So you can start thinking about things, th different things you might want to do for junior parents and below before you fill out these forms. Everyone talks about you want to get all the money out of the kid's name and everything else. And, and generally speaking, it makes sense. But it, everyone has to sit down and kind of figure out what makes most sense for them. Because if as a parent, if you have $100,000 and you say on the FAFSA, I have $100,000, you're looked upon as to pay around $4,000, $5,000 towards the cost of college based on $100,000. If you're a student and you indicate I have $100,000, you're being asked to pay $20,000 towards the cost of college. So look at it as you're not being asked to pay for that, but you've actually reduced the availability of space for financial aid, i.e. grant money, if this is the case. So things you might want to move around or adjust, et cetera, before you fill out the uh, financial aid forms. Obviously consult your financial planner and everything else because of tax implications and everything else before you do anything, but this is how the equation works. Part four, parent's income. Uh, when it comes to parent income, it's a sliding scale. So the more you make, the more they expect you to contribute towards college. An easy kind of on the back of the napkin equation for most families, for me at least, is this. Whatever your adjusted gross income is, that's the number they're looking for, by the way, for your income. Whatever your adjusted gross income is, assume it's 20% of that number they want you to pay towards the cost of college. So if you make 100,000, 20% uh, of that is 20,000. If you make 200,000, that's 40,000. That's kind of a rough equation to kind of figure out kind of how much they want you to pay towards college. Now when it comes to, excuse me, the financial aid uh, equation. The easiest thing to do is not to write this all down. You can if you want. We're also gonna post this on YouTube. Also, I provide the slides to all the parents. So any parent who wants the slides, uh, I'll provide my email at the end. You can just email me, I send you all the slides. The easiest way of figuring out your expected family contribution is to go on to College Board. On College Board, they have an expected family calculator. It lets you play with the numbers. So essentially, you can figure out what happens if I make more money this year? What if happens if I make less money this year? What happens if I spend down the money I have? What happens if I don't spend the money I have? These are different ways you can kind of figure out what's the best case scenario to be able to provide my family with the most financial assistance or at least the most space available to get the most financial opportunities out there. Now that being said, let's start talking about the next form in line, which some of you will have to fill out, not all of you. It's called the CSS profile form. Now this is where the financial aid, I guess, world differs completely. Basically because the profile will ask you for everything. It will ask you for home value. It, it, it essentially for the home, it'll ask you when you bought the home, how much you bought it for, how much it's due, how much is on the first mortgage, how much is on the second mortgage, has it been refinanced, how much you think it's worth. They go very in depth with, these, uh, with the CSS profile form. Another difference between the CSS and the FAFSA, besides the CSS counts to home, the CSS will also ask you about retirement assets. The CSS will also go more in depth about all your financials. The FAFSA form has around 90 to 100 questions. Depending on how you answer some questions, other questions will be generated. Very straightforward. There's about maybe realistically 15 financial questions on the FAFSA. The CSS profile, completely different. The CSS profile has hundreds of financial questions. The form itself ranges anywhere from 400 questions and above. If you get overwhelmed with the FAFSA or the CSS, hit the save button. They both have save buttons. Take your time, come back, do not rush. The FAFSA form does have the opportunity that if you make a mistake after you submit it, you can come back and make changes up to a dozen times. The CSS profile, you cannot do that. The CSS profile form, by the way, is completed on the College Board site. So if you have to fill out the CSS, you're filling it out on the College Board site. You're logging into the CSS as the student. That's the way you log in through their SAT account, essentially, that they more than likely have already created. As you can kind of realize now, 
you are accessing all financial aid forms as the student, the FAFSA, the CSS, any state forms that are required. You access them as the student themselves. Now, when you're doing the CSS profile form, once again, another difference between the FAFSA and the CSS, there are many differences. The FAFSA form is free. There's no charge to fill out the FAFSA form. So if you go online and if online uh, is asking you to pay a, a fee for FAFSA, you're on the wrong website. If the fee online is for the CSS profile, that is correct because the CSS does provide a fee. You have to pay $25 for the first school we get to fill out the CSS and $6 for each additional school. Now, when it comes to the CSS profile form, you can call each school's financial aid office and ask them, which forms do you need? Okay, this is a very important thing to do because these schools, once you ask them which schools, what forms they require, you can also ask them which deadlines do you have? A lot of schools have different deadlines. For the junior parents, if you're doing early decision, they typically want the financial aid forms in by the early decision deadline. So if your early decision deadline for early decision one is November 1st, you have to get all the applications for financial aid in by November 1st. If it's early decision two, whatever the early decision deadline is, whether it's January or February or March, same scenario. When it comes to colleges, always contact, always ask questions. The more questions you can ask, the better scenario you'll find yourself in. Now, when it comes to the CSS profile form, one of the things I talked to you guys about earlier, specifically about the early decision uh, parents in the audience, for those considering early decision, for the juniors, for the sophomores, et cetera, Early decision typically does increase the chance of you getting accepted to the college, in some cases by up to 50%. So it does add a huge add, added value, I guess, if you're considering early decision. But a lot of us are scared because if we lock into the college and we don't know what they're gonna give us, where does that put us? Well, this is what you need to do. You need to start using the net price calculators. Most of them are located, as you see here, on College Board. If you want to, there's actually a net price calculator video on College Board. If you just Google College Board's net price calculator, you actually get the screen you see in front of you here. It'll kind of go into a minute, actually it's two minutes or so video showing you what the net price calculator is more in depth, but I want to explain to you what it is. The net price calculator is exactly the same thing as the expected family calculator. The only difference is it's gonna at the end provide you a PDF for your specific college of how much scholarship money in some cases, but more along the lines of, what it really does more along the lines of, is how much grant money this college can provide you. So, if you're considering early decision, and you're a little bit uh, scared about the price tag, the school may cost 70, 80, 85,000 or more, and you're wondering, can we afford it? Should we do early decision? First place to do, first place to go, is to the college, is net price calculator. You can even Google the college's name and net price calculator. A lot of schools have these on their own websites. What you do is you fill in all your uh, financial information in net price calculator. By the way, it doesn't go anywhere, so no one knows what you're plugging in. Get the PDF, and if the PDF at the end says, if your student comes here, we'll provide you, let's say, $40,000 in grant money. You print out that PDF. That's basically like your golden ticket, your safety net for when if the student does get accepted, if they don't get the 40,000 or more, or within that range, let's say like a 38,000 of grant money, the free money, if they don't get that money, you go right to the admissions office and you say to them, thank you for the acceptance, we need to speak with somebody, we've been accepted, but based on your net price calculator, we're short on financial aid. We will deposit immediately after our award letter is amended and we receive the funds we should be getting. Now obviously your numbers have to make sense. What I mean by your numbers, I mean your income and asset numbers. If you indicate on the net price calculator you make $100,000 a year, on your taxes you show $200,000 a year, then obviously it's gonna be a big discrepancy. So you wanna be as close as possible to your numbers even if you're playing around with everything. Now that being said, let me give you guys an example of how a net price calculator I guess the results look based on a certain family dynamic. Here on the screen now you're gonna see, we have Harvard's net price calculator. Now you go on to Harvard's net price calculator, it asks you like eight, maybe 12 questions. There's not a lot of questions here, it's very straightforward, all the net price calculators. 
Now here on the left, you see the total cost of Harvard, which everything included costs around, let's say $77,000 or so, all things included. We're assuming we have a family size of four with one student going off to college. With a parent's income, their just gross combined of $100,000 and parents having assets outside of retirement of $50,000, just to throw numbers into the mix to see what happens. Well, at Harvard, if you make $100,000 with $50,000 investments, you will be receiving $64,841 of grant money. I know it says scholarships, but Harvard doesn't provide scholarships. The, the tier based on academics is so high, there's no such thing really. It's really grant money they're providing you, need-based funding. So if you look at this, if you make $100,000, you have $50,000 of savings, Harvard costs $77,000, your out-of-pocket cost is under $12,000 to send your student off to Harvard. This is why I indicated in the beginning, do not look at the price tag of the colleges. Start doing the research. And one of the best tools to utilize throughout this process, regardless of the sticker price of the college, is the school's net price calculator. This will allow you to start building knowledge and insight about what the colleges cost. That way you can feel more comfortable applying early decision one, early decision two, there's also first choice out there, or early actions, et cetera, et cetera, or even just building your college list per se. Now that being said, let's talk about the different dynamics of the family scenario, I guess you can call it, throughout the financial aid process. When it comes to divorce in the world of financial aid, it gets to be a little tricky depending on your situation. In the world of college, if you're only filling out the FAFSA form, let me give you an example. On the FAFSA, it's gonna ask your student, um, what's the parent's marital status? You're either gonna be married or remarried, divorced or separated, widowed, um, unmarried, or unmarried living together has been on there before, or unable to provide parents information. That's the answers for all of it. So you see here, being separated or divorced is the same answer. And in the world of financial aid, if you're separated from your spouse for more than three months, they typically take the spouse's finances out of the mix. So if you indicate on the FAFSA form that the student lives with the, or the student's parents are divorced or separated, another question gets generated. Next question is gonna ask, who does a student live with 51% of the time or more? Once you indicate that they live with mom 51% of the time or more, all dad's questions about his finances, all of them, are erased from the form. They're not even asked of you, which means obviously it's the big financial advantage, good, bad, or indifferent. I'm not saying uh, you have to go in one direction or another, but if you reduce the incomes on the form, yes, you are able to provide more space for financial assistance, i.e. more opportunities to receive more grant money. Now, downside is if you're remarried, for those who are remarried, the step parent does take the place of the biological parent, good, bad, or indifferent. So if you're remarried, your taxes, your finances, your income, et cetera, get added to the form. That's the FAFSA approach. Let's talk CSS profile. CSS profile is completely different. It's school dependent. Some schools are gonna to say to you, we do not need the non-custodial parents information. Other schools will say to you, we do need the non-custodial parents information. This is why it's important if your school says to you, yes, we will ask for both biological parents information, that when you're creating or doing the net price calculators, kind of figuring out the numbers, you have to plug in both parents' numbers to kind of get a good idea in your own mind if their aid is available or not. Because unfortunately, if you are uh, applying to a school that wants both custodial and non-custodial parents, FAFSA form, sorry, not FAFSA, CSS profile forms uh, completed, that means if you're both remarried, that means four people's financial situations are being added in, incomes and assets. So in some cases, there's just no space for financial aid assistance, unfortunately. But this is why you do the research. Now that being said, let's talk about what happens for a lot of families nowadays, is the overlapping college of students. Believe it or not, having a student overlapping college is actually a huge benefit. I know a lot of families don't see it that way, but after this slide, you might consider it differently. And the reason why I say that is because when you apply to all the financial aid forms and send your student off to college, they're applying all your income and assets based on one student going to college. If you have two students going to college, what happens is they take the amount that they expect you to pay for one student 
and they cut it in half. So as you see on the chart here, we're just using even numbers, you know, average numbers, just to make the math easy for you guys. If you have one student going off to school and the school's total cost of attendance is $35,000, we're just using even numbers, okay? And you fill out all the forms and the forms say you can pay 20,000. What that means is you have $15,000 of space to receive financial assistance. Let's go to the second part. So let's say you have twins going in or your student's already in college. And now the second student's going in, which means you're filling out all the forms again. The students, by the way, do not need to go to the same college. We're just indicating each college costs 35,000 to make the math easy for everyone. So 35,000 of college costs per student, 70,000 total, fill out all the forms again. The forms once again say you can pay 20,000. However, that 20,000 is now divided between the two students. So now you're paying 10,000 for student one and 10,000 for student two, which means you've now increased student one from having $15,000 of financial aid space. Now they have $25,000 of financial aid space. Your goal to receive financial assistance from any college, for me, is very simple. You have to do one of two things. One, lower your expected family contribution. Having students overlapping college will automatically do that. Or two, increase the cost of attendance in the eyes of the college, such as showing them that your travel cost is higher, your book cost is higher, or you need certain supplies or arts or art things, which increases your budget. These are the ways either one, increasing what their cost of attendance is to provide more space for financial assistance, or two, reducing your expected family contribution, which also increases the space for financial consideration. That's how you obtain more uh, grant money, more free financial aid in the world of college. Now that being said, let's talk about frequently made errors, okay? And when it comes to frequently made errors, the biggest errors I see in this entire process are very simple. And I'm talking about the Common App, Coalition App, the FAFSA, the CSS, the admissions applications. I'm talking about all the applications here for college. The biggest errors across the board are very simple. First name, last name, social, and birthday. You get these four right, and you're 99% of the time fine. These are the things that delay everything. So if your name, like my name, is Eduardo, I do not put on the FAFSA form Ed, even though everyone calls me Ed or Eddie. I do not use a nickname. If you're remarried, make sure that your Social Security, your name, your last name is correct. Because if it's not correct, that's going to be a delay in the process. It's going to indicate, doesn't recognize your name, etc. For those that have, uh, uh, for students in the audience, if you do not know your parents' uh, birthday, or for parents, if you do not know your student's birthday, double check. This is a big error. The social is the biggest one of all I see happen all the time. To give you an example, uh, I want to say about 10 years ago, we had a family that the student asked the parent for their social because your socials go on the FAFSA form. And the parent had given them the mother's social, and the student wasn't clarifying that they needed their social. So the student put the mom's social on everything the financial aid forms, the admissions forms, so everything was just a disaster, okay? Double check what you're doing, take your time. Once again, there are save buttons, do not rush. There's a lot of errors made here throughout this process, and those are the four biggest errors made all the time. Now, for junior parents and for senior parents now, especially with everything going on, let me talk about something that a lot of families are not discussing, neither financially or admissions-wise the social media landmines. For students out there, whether you're a senior going in, you've already been accepted, or a junior looking to do admission stuff, if you have anything that's not politically correct or something you don't want your parents to see, take it down, take it all off. Do not start taking sides politically now. It doesn't matter what your cause is, if you're looking to get into college or if you're looking to stay in the college. And the reason I say this is because I'm not looking to take sides, either direction doesn't matter. What I'm saying is about three or four years ago, there was a few dozen students accepted to Harvard. And a lot of you can look this up in Google. And then they started liking and posting stuff on Facebook that some people didn't like. Good, bad, or indifferent, doesn't matter which side you're on. It doesn't matter to me, I don't really care. Those students are basically 
sent messages that, that no longer allowed to come to Harvard. This is going to continue to happen. Admissions offices look at your social media pages. They look at Twitter. They look at Facebook. They look at Instagram. The last thing you want to do is shoot yourself in the foot, good, bad, or indifferent, because you post something you and your friend think is funny that somebody else doesn't think it's funny. Okay? If you want to be as safe as possible, make all your social media platforms private. I'm talking to students specifically here. Because what you think is funny now, when you're 40 years old, you're probably not going to think it's funny. And a lot of the people in admissions range in ages from 25 and up. So be careful, specifically from the admissions point of view here. I've seen a lot of students get accepted and then not get accepted. I've also seen a lot of admissions officers, because I know dozens of admissions officers, and they tell me, especially in the competitive colleges, they are going on Facebook, they are going on Instagram, they are going everywhere to figure out ways to take you off their accepted list where students are considering because the world of college is extremely competitive. Do not make it easy on them to be denied an acceptance because of something immature or dumb or whatever you want to call it. Now that being said, let's veer more into what I see happening a lot now. The scams, the frauds, etc. What you see on your screen now is a corporation called the College Financial Advisory. This corporation was founded in 2005. This was a scam that lasted years and years and years. This company, what they did was they bought list of basically anyone who has a student in high school, essentially I believe the list was. As you see at the top of the page here on the screen on the picture, they actually have a court um, notification because they were sued by a couple different states. This corporation actually uh, defrauded over or sorry, 76,000 people for over $4.7 million. What they were doing was, they would send the letter you see in front of you, indicating with a seal at the top, it looked very official to a government seal, indicating that there's additional paperwork required for you to receive your financial aid. And if you didn't apply for this, you weren't gonna receive financial aid. And to make matters worse, if you were late, they actually added fees on top, they charged you more. This organization had nothing to do with any government agency, nothing to do with any college, but they were able to scam people for years and years and years to the tune of $4.7 million. The crazy thing is, I'm starting to see this happening again. I'm starting to get parents emailing me and calling me and sending me stuff through text message. Ed, I was told to send this person my bank statement or my routing information or my social to make sure I can get money from the CARES Act. Everyone's heard about additional financial aid stuff. Do not send anything. Contact the college directly. This organization, crazy to sound, was shut down. Excuse me. However, they had two websites. The two websites you see at the bottom of the slide here, the college one and the student one. The student website one is still actually up after being shut down by a bunch of different, uh, I believe, state attorney's offices. The other website, the student one down the bottom, is still operational. It's still being, uh, still available, which is just crazy to me that's still available, still being able to actually be uh, pulled up. Also for parents, if you want to find, uh, I guess we also have, just to give you an insight, we do have a YouTube video just on the new scams we're starting to see pop up. Not just from uh, people like this, but also from college advisors, people. We also have scams and things are popping up based on mailing scams, phishing scams, as far as emails, uh, phone call scams we see popping up. It, it, it's, it's, it's just terrible. It's just disgusting what's happening, but it's what's happening now. If you want to see the YouTube video we have just about the scams and the frauds and things that are happening now, uh, once again, I'll give you our YouTube channel here at the end, but be vigilant and understand there's a lot more of this stuff happening than ever before, unfortunately. And this group by itself was able to scam 76,000 people, 76,000 people before the government could stop it. It lasted years and years and years, okay? That being said, a great resource for this is actually the federal government, believe it or not. They have here, as you see on our slide, at the bottom, student, uh, studentaid.gov resources slash scams. This is a great website. It gives you information about student loan debt scams are popping up, identity, uh, uh, identity theft scams are popping up, uh, financial aid scams are popping up. This website here, specifically this link we provide you, is a great resource. 
If you think it's too good to be true, believe me, it is too good to be true. I've seen so many parents. I've had parents call me. I've been doing this 20 years, remember. I've had parents calling me about phone scams, uh, email scams. Uh, I've had two parents this, this week alone about people texting them about different things about they're basically being scammed. But I know they're scams, but they don't. So if you're unaware, call someone. Call guidance. Call the college. You can even call our office. We, we see this every day. But here is a great resource from the web, from the government, providing more insight about what's going on. Once again, we do have a YouTube video on this. If you want to watch that, please email us. We'll give you the links for those as well. Which brings us to the main reason. I already talked about the Harvard net price calculator. But this is another college I wanted to point out because I've been using this slide for, it's got to be going on 15 years now because Cornell has been generous for a long time. Cornell University, just to give you an example, cost over $70,000, $70,000. So $77,000, that's one of those basically in the $80,000 college range. Let's say you fill out all the financial aid forms. In the financial aid forms, you can pay $10,000 a year. That means you subtract out what you can pay, you're left with $67,000 of financial need. Cornell has historically, and I mean decades and decades, met 100% of families' financial need. And you might be thinking, well, Ed, that's great. I'd love my student to go to Harvard or Cornell, but maybe they're not going to those types of colleges or that tier of college, put that way. Providence University, Muhlenberg, Franklin and Marshall, uh, Williams, Haverford, Swarthmore, all these colleges meet 90, 95, 100% of need met. You might be thinking, well, that's great, Ed, you know that. For you to find out how generous a college is, it's very simple. You go to College Board, type in the school's name, pull up their profile, and click on their financial aid tab. On every colleges, I would say about 90% of them, if not more, it shows you how generous the college is. So where I'm getting this 100%, I know this already, but if you go on College Board, it will show you every school, how generous they are, how much need met they will give you guys. This is why doing the research, going out there, looking at everything is the way to do things. Yes, the sticker price is shocking for a lot of these colleges. But there is the research out there that you on your own can go out there for free and figure out, is the college financially affordable to us? Is it generous? These things are out there. They are available. Now, that being said, let's talk about appeals. And we also have on our YouTube channel, we put it on about a week ago, actually maybe two weeks ago for the seniors out there, uh, how to appeal, the right way to appeal. And the reason I say the right way to appeal is because I've been doing this 20 years and one of the, the myths I hear all the time is, you always appeal. That's not the way this works. Okay, and let me explain why that's not the way this works. In 20 years, I've seen parents appeal, and three things happen every time you appeal. One, the college gives you more, which everyone thinks is going to happen, and it does happen a lot. Two, you appeal, and the college doesn't give you anything, which also happens, unfortunately, a lot. And the third, which no one talks about but does happen a lot, you appeal and they reduce your financial aid. The reason they reduce your financial aid is because they see something during your appeal that they didn't see before. Or they look at an asset that you forgot to put on there a different way that you look at it. Now, we do have on the YouTube channel a specific financial aid presentation that goes a lot more in depth into financial aid. It's actually the presentation I typically do in the fall at other high schools I work at, uh, or I guess I do the presentation for. So if you want more in-depth information, watch our YouTube video specifically about financial aid or basically send me uh, an email and I'll send you the links for those YouTube channels to watch all the differences between why you should appeal, why you shouldn't appeal, things to consider. Also on, our, uh, on the YouTube channel for appeals only, we talk about how to appeal, the right way to send an appeal in. I guess the right way to kind of get more out of them or what I've seen in 20 years is the most effective ways of getting more money out of the school. That being said, the moment you're accepted to the college, about a month or so later on, you start receiving what you see in front of you here. It's the award letter. And the reason I started this slide off by talking about appeals is because the moment you receive your award letter is when you have to start figuring out, have we received enough? If we haven't received enough, it's time to negotiate. And the way you negotiate is you go to the school's financial aid office and start asking for more assistance. Now, the way that you typically appeal is usually based on, for juniors and below, on an additional college giving you more money. 
i.e. what I told you guys before, utilize the safety schools for scholarship funding. So let's say that school A, where your student really wants to go, has given you a $10,000 scholarship. But school B, maybe a safety school, has given you a $20,000 scholarship. You go back to school A and you say to them, we're you know, over the moon for the acceptance. Can't believe we got in. We're loving everything. Love the school. This is where we want to go. But we want to make you aware that this other college has provided us with a $20,000 scholarship or grant or $30,000 scholarship or grant. The first thing you want to ask is, can you match that amount? And then don't say anything else. The best way to do an appeal, typically under uh, the best scenarios, is face-to-face -face with a financial aid officer. Second best way is email, because it allows you to sit down and write everything out, send it the appeal, as well as the other offers and see what they do. The third way is over the phone. Typically now, what I've seen, and I've helped, I wanna say about maybe 100, 150 families do appeals in the last three months. It's obviously with the job loss and everything else, there's been a lot of appeals going out, but it's also appeals based on other colleges giving more money. When it comes to the appeals, think of the appeal as, when you're dealing with a financial aid officer, they are on your side. It's not you versus the financial aid officer. What typically happens when you send an appeal in is they take all your information, they gather it, and then provide that information, that insight to a higher up asking them, can we give this person more money? So think of the financial aid officer as a person on your side. It's not you versus them. It's not the way this works. Okay. That's the person, the nicer you are, the more likely it is you're going to receive financial assistance, okay? Now, when it comes to the award letter, it's gonna show you the scholarships, the grants, the loans, the work programs. If you have a job loss or anything that's affected you financially, I would highly consider appealing. Obviously, I would look at the appeal YouTube channel link we have and look at that and make sure nothing kind of falls through the cracks so you're safe with appealing. But generally speaking, if there's a job loss or loss of parent, or medical issues, obviously what's going on with everything in the world, then I would definitely highly consider appealing. But first, look at the appeal and see, are there anywhere here that there's pitfalls where I might get in trouble? That being said, we do have a newsletter that goes out every month. We have a newsletter for seniors, juniors, etc. If you want the newsletter, and it talks about what you need to be doing that specific month. If you want the newsletter, I'm going to give you my email. Just email us and just, I need to know the grade level you're coming in from, so what grade level your student's in, excuse me, because the newsletter is grade level specific, and uh, I need grade level, and I need your email, basically, so what email you want the newsletter to go to. The newsletter covers every month what you're supposed to be doing. That being said, here are some links, some useful links for pretty much everyone on the call here from seniors and below. For information about college, both on the admissions side and the financial aid side, for me, FAFSA does have, does have a lot of good financial stuff, but the best place for me across the board has always been College Board. They have a wealth of knowledge about a lot of great stuff. Scholarship searches, FastWeb and FinAid are the two largest free scholarship searches in the world. In addition to that, you also have, uh, if you, have, you want us as a resource, we do have a newsletter that goes out every month. You can follow us on the newsletter. We also have a, uh, a Facebook page. If you follow our Facebook page, every almost every third day now I'm posting stuff about different colleges opening or not opening, online courses. I also have stuff on there about fraud, one of the frauds I saw pop up last week, which I mentioned to you guys about before. So every basically third or fourth day, I'm putting stuff on our Facebook page. If you want to follow our Facebook page, we also put on our Facebook page where we're doing our presentations, okay? Also, if you want any information about our YouTube videos, we have YouTube videos about financial aid, about doing appeals, about the COVID situation, about the anxiety, about stress. It's a, it's a video I actually did with a colleague of mine, uh, David Fugel, who's very good as far as dealing with anxiety, anxiety excuse, me, excuse me, and stress. We have a video on YouTube just about that. If you want to watch our YouTube uh, videos, if you go onto YouTube and just basically plug in uh, Ed Zamora and financial aid, you start getting all my YouTube videos. They all pop up there. Okay, or if you email me, I can also send you the links as well. Now, that being said, when it comes to this entire process, this is a family dynamic situation across the board. Every family is different. This year, my wife and I uh, are actually expecting. So 
we've already had a discussion and I'm not opening my office this year. Good, bad, or indifferent, whether there's a vaccine or not. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't want to be the first person to get the vaccine. I don't know. No one knows what the vaccine will do or won't do, et cetera. So for this year, since we know that uh, our son, we're having uh, a boy, so pretty nice, the doctor told us, um, I'll be doing everything through Zoom, everything through conference calls. So I am still working with parents. I am still helping out with financial aid forms, et cetera. But everything will be done virtually. Uh, because obviously uh, our son won't have any, um, at that point in time, any immune system set up, uh, so we don't want to risk it. Uh, but I am available. Uh, I've been doing a lot of conference calls with parents on every aspect of this, uh, appeals, so on and so forth. So if you do need help, I am still available in the fall to help with financial aid forms and everything else. Uh, for senior parents, you guys already know, uh, I help out with financial aid loans and stuff like that. So if you need loan help, I actually help out with that. And I believe we have a video going up about the loan stuff in about a week or so. But when it comes to parents, uh, families specifically, as I mentioned before, your students are listening to you. And uh, what I've noticed from a lot of the families I've dealt with as far as the conference calls, when the students are on the conference calls, they're looking for the parent to provide guidance. And for me, um, now becoming a parent, i.e., uh, I look at things a lot differently. Uh, I guess you can kind of look at it from my mom's perspective. Um, I'm over 40 years old, and my mom still looks at me as I'm like, you know, her five-year-old child which I'm assuming pretty much every parent on this conference call looks at their child, whether they're 18, 19, or 20, like a five-year-old. Uh, sometimes they act like a five-year-old, but they look at them as basically their child. So no one is going to look down on you, good, bad, or indifferent, if you take the safe route, uh, whether they don't go to a, a, fur, a further away college or whether they elect to take a gap year or a deferment uh, semester off. Every family dynamic is different. And as I mentioned before, I've had phone calls uh, the entire gambit this year from job loss, bankruptcy, foreclosure, uh, to, to death, unfortunately. It's, it's uh, something that we, we, none of us want, but it's, it's a reality out there. And uh, every family has to look at it and provide the risk assessment for themselves. So if the college is opening up or is not opening up, uh, this is something you have to discuss. Uh, another thing that a lot of families have asked me about, which I'll touch on now, um, is the college is opening up and doing online courses. If the college is doing online courses and your student is at home, I would definitely ask the college for a reduction in cost. I do not see the value in paying a 50 or 60 or even $70,000 tuition if my student's going to be in the living room on an iPad. I, I don't care the name of the school. I want a reduction in tuition cost if this is going to happen. I'm not saying the schools aren't going to reduce the cost, but this is something I would be asking for. If I'm paying for your facility, uh, whether it has housekeeping or rooms or a spa or a climbing wall or the biggest cafeteria in the world, I, I don't care. If I'm paying for that, I expect a reduction in the tuition cost if we are being asked to go online, good, bad, or indifferent. Okay, that's my take on the whole thing. And that's something I've been hearing a lot of parents about as well, is what their take is is the same thing. They don't wanna pay a full freight tuition if it's gonna be online. And I expect a lot of colleges will take the right course here and will reduce the cost if it is online. Now, that being said, loans. When it comes to loans, every family situation is different. Uh, we have a Sally Mae slide on here because we do have uh, an alignment and association with Sally Mae. And uh, they actually have been, uh, in our eyes, the best loan to take out or one of the top best three loans to take out in the last four years. Um, there's various variables why that is so. I'm not saying that Sally Mae is one of the best three because they're a partner, basically. I'm just saying it actually has come that way. Mostly due to the fact that the Federal Reserve keeps lowering interest rates. And now that we're at a 0% interest rate, the private lenders like Sally Mae actually provide a very competitive rate because typically three years and going back, the best rates were actually the federal rates or the state rates uh, because they were able to be essentially subsidize the lower rate because of taxes and selling bonds and those kind of things or the state lottery, it, it will allow the state and federal loans to be lower on the richest rate side. Now, based on the interest rates being so low, uh, I've actually seen Sally Mae loans in the threes. Um, I've never seen anyone in the threes before as far as an interest rate. Not the Sally Mae people, not any private lenders, not the federal, not the state. Um, if you are considering taking a federal loan out, uh, you would be using a parent plus loan uh, I like the Parent PLUS loans and I don't like the Parent PLUS loans. The reason I like the Parent PLUS loan is it allows you to take out as much as you want. 
the reason I don't like the Parent Plus loan is because it's got a pretty high interest rate. Uh, you're talking about in the sevens. And it also has an origination fee, an origination fee of uh, over 4%, which means if you take out a $10,000 loan through a Parent Plus loan, you're paying a $400 fee to take out that loan. Now, good, bad, or indifferent, some parents are okay with that, some parents are not. Uh, every family is different, as I mentioned before. Uh, but if you are shopping around, if you wouldn't mind uh, taking a look at Sally May, we have, actually have our link on the screen here. And if you'd like, I can actually even send you our, our link for the Sally May landing page, which actually helps our organization. So if you are applying for a Sally May loan, if you use our link, it actually helps our group. Uh, it doesn't provide any additional assistance, but one of the main reasons I like Sally May, and we agreed to do the partnership, and uh, we've been talking to Sally May for probably, uh, I want to say five, six years before we even did the partnership. The main reason I like it is because Sally May is one of the only loans that will allow the parent to co-sign for their student, because any private lender you take out the student loan, the student takes out the loan, they're going to need a co-signer. There's no such thing as a student loan not providing or not needing a co-sign. Even the parent loan, uh, it's a loan in the parent's name only, one of the reasons they don't like it. But the Sally May loan will allow you to take the loan out in the student's name, parent can co-sign, and then after a year of payments, it's one of the only loans the parent can be taken off as a co-sign. It's one of the things I like about the loan. They, excuse me. They also have a partnership through Chegg, where uh, if you email me, I'll send you the information about the Chegg partnership with Sally May, where they actually provide months and months and months of free tutoring service through Chegg for your student if they take out a Sally May loan. So between being able to take, be taken off the loan as a parent and leave it as a student's own uh, private loan, as well as a Chegg, and a few other things, uh, that's one of the reasons we kept the partnership with Sally May. And if you are looking at Sally May, once again, if you use our link, it does help our cause. It doesn't provide you guys with anything, any extra benefits per se, but it does help our cause uh, a lot, dramatically. Now, that being said, here is my contact information. You can see on the screen is our email address at the organization. Uh, if you have questions, you can always email us. If you have um, any questions, you can also uh, give us a phone call or you can even text us. That's actually my cell phone number on the screen. Uh, every time I do this presentation, everyone thinks I'm out of my mind uh, because I do 80 presentations. So I give the average presentations 50 to 100 people. So I give something like 4,000 people my uh, cell phone number. Uh, but in the reality is the easiest way to get a hold of me is text message, believe it or not. Text message, email, and then phone call is the easiest way to get a hold of me if you have questions or concerns or you're not certain about things, um, that's the easiest way to get a hold of me. Uh, other than that, uh, that's pretty much the presentation for you guys. I, hopefully I covered a lot of stuff out there for you guys. Um, I'm sure if the guidance office wants to chime in. Well, we gotta thank you, uh, Ed. Once again, you provided some excellent information about um, not just financial aid, but the whole thinking of the college process. And I, I do think these days, um, you really can't look at college search and college application process without really keeping financial aid at the forefront. Um, so we would like to, to thank you. We know folks joined us uh, sometime as early as the six o'clock tonight, and it, this was a bit of a lengthy presentation, but it was just uh, very uh, compelling and interesting. Um, and certainly you can take down uh, Mr. Zamora's information. We will attempt to post this, post this as well as share the recording if you have friends who wanted to attend and couldn't, or if you'd like to see some of it again. Uh, we will open up to questions. Uh, certainly you can leave at any time, but we will open up to questions. And at least I will give a, a good shot at uh, trying to uh, answer your raised hands. If you look uh, on your screen, you at the bottom of your screen, I believe you are able to raise a hand if you do have a question. And um, if you do, we will let you speak if you'd like to, and uh, Mr. Zamora, Ed Zamora, will try to answer it. Okay, I see a hand from uh, a Mr. Weinberg, so I'm going to unmute, see if it works, and let him chat with the with our group. Uh, you can go ahead, Mr. Weinberg. Hi, Hi thank you. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Nope. Um, so my question is, if my income or our family income changes dramatically from one year to the next, how, how, do, you, um, how do you reach out to let either the financial aid uh, offices know, or, or at what level do you typically have to let them know if it changes dramatically? Good question. When it comes to pretty much every family, I talk about this more in depth in the fall, but I'm going to cover it now. 
when it comes to, let's talk about, uh, I guess, seniors. We'll start with seniors and answer the question first. So for seniors going into college next year, let's say you've done the 2019 taxes. And in 2018 taxes, you made a lot more. If your 2019 taxes have dropped by 20%, I'm talking about the adjusted gross income, that is consideration for going back to the college and saying, there's been a, a big financial change from one year, 2018 taxes you guys are evaluating me on versus 2019. Okay, that's, that's step number one. Step number two, if there's been a change based on job loss of any kind, whether it be company closing or being furloughed or whatever it is, contact the financial aid office immediately after you start looking at your components. And when, when I said to you guys to watch the video about appeals is because of this. The, the families who lose financial aid based on appeals are the ones who either omit something on the financial aid form or just plainly forget. And this is what I mean by plainly forget or make a mistake. This is a, this is a big mistake. I'll give you an example. You have a family of five and you have two kids in college. I see this happen all the time. And the oldest of the two kids in college is actually going into grad school. But you indicated on the FAFSA form, you have two kids going off to college. Then you go and do an appeal. When you send the financial aid forms in, by the way, there's no such thing as a human being sitting there calculating and figuring out what your, your, your financial aid is. It's not the way financial aid forms work. It's done by a giant computer at the college, basically. That's how they figure out your financial aid. So if you appeal and go in and say, I want you to look at this because of income drop or job loss or financial situation, the first thing they start asking you for is tax returns. And the next thing I start asking you for is a form called verification. Verification is going to ask for everyone in the household's name, everyone in the household's age, and everyone in the household's going to college. Then a human being is going to see that your oldest student may be 22, 23. They're going to start asking you more questions. And if they deem them a grad student, that does not count in the world of financial aid as two in college. So that's one of the errors. So you go from having a good EFC to now a huge EFC, cost of attendance. For parents of junior year, if your 2019 taxes, let's say you had, uh, I guess, sold before the market sold off, or if you have uh, money coming in from uh, overtime that you're not going to get in 2020, or your job went from paying you a certain amount and then reduced the amount, you want to make sure that once your award letters arrive from the college in senior year is to appeal as soon as possible. There are ways to appeal that make sense. It's just you want to sit down and think about if I send information about my taxes. Another, another time this happens, an example is you indicate on the financial aid forms you have very low in, uh, investments or cash or savings, but you have a lot of interest and dividends on your taxes they're gonna ask you for an asset verification form. So let's just, get, let me give you an example. You fill out the FAFSA and you put zero cash, zero investments, and then you do an appeal, and they ask you for your taxes, and they look at your taxes, and you have $3,000 of interest and $4,000 of, of dividends. They're gonna say, but you put on the FAFSA, you had no investments. They're gonna send you that form, and if you indicate zeros across the form again without an explanation, such as we bought a house with the money or it was used for medical bills. If you don't explain what happened to the money, they're going to increase your expected family contribution, i.e. you're going to lose financial aid. So yes, typically if there's a job loss or a change of adjusted gross income of 20% or more, I would appeal. But first, I'd look at all the aspects. Is there any landmines here that could kind of like make us lose aid? Does that kind of answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Uh, I think we have Mr. Uh, Epstein. You should be able to hopefully speak. Um, I was wondering, as far as getting financial aid, how does it work if your um, if your student has to um, audition for uh, to get into college and most likely won't be even finding out uh, about auditions until December. March. December, you, you, you mean? Well, the auditions, my daughter's interested in musical theater and um, they start doing auditions in like February, like the end of January and February. 
So, um, as far as the financial aid, what you want to do is, well, there's two things you want to do. First, you want to ask the admissions office, if, whether we're talking about Tisch or um, Juilliard or any other school, as far as the artistic approach, I mean, any of the arts. First thing you want to do is ask the admissions office, number one, is there any academic scholarship money? It's the first thing you want to ask the admissions office. Number two, is there any talent-based scholarship money? So you want to see if those funds are available first and what the requirements are going forward. Then you want to start working with the net price calculators to figure out how generous these colleges are. That way, with the net price calculators, you can be a little bit more certain based from a financial point of view if you're going to be okay or not. The reason you use the net price calculators is really twofold. Number one, to get an idea of what we're eligible for at this college. And number two, as a safety net. Because if you have that in hand, because once you do the college's net price calculator, and by the way, all you need to do is Google Juilliard net price calculator, or Google any school's name and the term net price calculator, and you get that school's net price calculator. The second reason it's so important is because each one of them at the end provides you a PDF. You save that PDF, just in case the college doesn't give you enough funding. That's the way you do it. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay, no problem. We had a question uh, prior to the meeting from um, a parent via email that said, uh, that said uh, if grandmama was going to basically pay for college, um, where, where should that money stay up until the time it's uh, used to pay for college? Should that stay in grandmama's bank account? Bank account? How, how to hide it? No, I, I get a lot of these questions about that. Um, usually I'm not being videotaped, but it's the same thing. Um, <laughs> the way it works is this, to be honest with you. Everyone always, always asks because one of the forms, the, I, I think I know where the question's coming from. On the CSS profile form, and I could go over this in the fall presentation, which we have online, so in a more detail, but I'll explain it now. On the CSS profile form, there's actually a section which will ask you, is the family receiving any scholarship help from any relatives, uncles, aunts, grandparents, etc.? That's where this question is probably coming from, from the CSS. And this is the way it actually works. I typically say to the, to the uh, family, first, check with their financial advisor, uh, tax-wise, what makes the most sense for grandma or the uncle and aunt. First, figure that out first. And then second, typically just send a check in. It doesn't matter because... Everyone always wonders, well, what happens when they get the, the check from grandma in the billing office? Uh, what happens? And this is what happens, by the way, when a check goes to billing, because I've worked with the billing offices at multiple colleges. The Office of Billing only cares about two things for any check that comes in. Number one, does the check on there anywhere say scholarship? If it says like Coca-Cola scholarship or the duct tape scholarship for going to prom and duct tape kind of scholarship, they make a copy of it. They pass it on to financial aid and they ask them, were you aware of this scholarship? If they say no, they may or may not reduce your, your, your scholarship or grant you're getting at the college. So if you know you're getting an outside scholarship, let's say you're getting something from the, 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 the help of the guidance office, something local. If the scholarship is re being written in the student's name, maybe you forgot to tell the college. I can't go further in detail because we're being videotaped, okay? If you want more information about it, if it's coming from the school or something local, call me or email me, I'll explain further detail. If it's going directly to the college, then you wanna call the financial aid office and ask them, if we bring in any scholarship funding, does that money count as our money or does it count against your money? And what I mean by our money is, when you fill out all the financial aid forms, if the financial aid form says, your expected family contribution, what you're expected to pay is 10,000. And if I get a scholarship for 2,000, from an outside source, is that towards my 10,000 or are you taking it off of your money? The college will tell you which way they're looking at it. And by the way, it's like a 50-50 split. Some colleges say, you bring in two out of the 10, it's yours. Other colleges say, no, whatever aid we give you, we're reducing it. You can also decline the scholarship, by the way. So if you get an outside scholarship, and it's gonna reduce your four-year scholarship and you're scared about the reduction in the years two, three, and four, you don't have to take it if it's being used against you. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you. I, I see no other hands raised and uh, I have to thank you again for uh, your presentation. Uh, very uh, helpful for us. Sorry, and sorry. We'll I forgot the, the second part of the check. Sorry, I just realized. The okay. second part of the check, if it comes in from grandma's name, as long as it doesn't bounce, they don't care. 
Okay. The billing office only cares if the check bounces, if it doesn't say scholarship. They're not going to start some weird CSI thing and start figuring out whose grandma is this. That's not the way it works. Okay. Very good to know. I, I assume that, that people will, uh, you know, will hear more questions. As you said, we'll see you again in the fall. Uh, we have had presentations uh, each year as best we could in the fall and the spring. Sometimes we've had as many as, uh, as four in a year um, because we think people need to know uh, information from wherever they, they can get it and, and try to uh, use it to make good decisions. And again, I have to thank you not only for talking about money, but really talking about family decisions. So uh, I, again, I can't thank you enough. We, we will share your information out to our families again and uh, certainly welcome you back uh, in the fall if you'd be able to join us. Sure, definitely. Hopefully we can, hopefully. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Guys.